Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar on factors and multiples. I hope uh, I'm clearly audible. Uh, if you can hear me, can you please uh, write yes uh, in the chat box so that we can get started? Okay, great. I can see that you all can hear me clearly. So uh, let's get started. Once again, welcome to this webinar on factors and multiples. I think it is one of the most important topics uh, uh, when it comes to numbers, number properties. And uh, um, if you can master this really well, then um, uh, believe me, you should be able to solve a lot of questions based on prime, well, simplicity, divisibility. So uh, a lot of areas in which you can uh, apply th this concept. Uh, so first of all, very quickly, let me introduce myself before we get started. Uh, my name is Saqib. I'm going to be a host today. Uh, some of you may have attended my webinar before. Uh, so uh, I'm one of the uh, product lead at uh, GMAT Wiz, and I'm also one of the principal architect of the whole GMAT uh, intelligence design that you see on the platform. Uh, I've been this in, the, in this tech industry for close to, I think, uh, this will be my 11th year, I would say. And, uh, I love teaching quant. I love creating a tech product, uh, uh, and uh, one of my uh, belief I believe I like simplifying uh, concepts uh, as much as possible for everyone, uh, so that uh, you know uh, whatever I'm teaching it's understandable and you can apply them uh, wherever you can. Uh, and I also love, love taking uh, these exams. I've taken GMAT myself. I have a Q15 quant, 710, and those of you who are from India, you might know the Indian version of uh, the MBA exams, which is CAT. I have a 99.9 Asian quant in CAT also. Uh, so that's that's a briefly about me. Uh, um, let's talk about how we are going to conduct this webinar. So the webinar would follow almost a similar structure, which I usually conduct all my webinars in. We'll start off with the main section where I am going to discuss why are these topics important. And, uh, and obviously, I'll be using a number of questions to help you understand how to apply these concepts. And I'll be keeping about 10 to 15 minutes at the end in case you have any questions, any doubts regarding the questions that I've discussed. Or say if you want to you know, ask any questions related to GMAT or GMAT quant, then feel free to ask me all those questions at the end of the webinar. OK, uh, with this, uh, let's get started. Uh, let's first of all understand what are we going to learn today. Uh, so uh, first of all, I'll start off uh, what are the things that I'll be covering. Uh, and I'll be primarily covering three different things, primes, uh, LCM, GCD, and uh, a little bit of divisibility. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of the webinar, uh, these are the three major areas uh, in number properties, apart from statistics, of course, uh, where you would be applying uh, factors and multiples a lot. Uh, so it makes sense that you master these three really well. Um, and uh, how I'm going to basically help you understand and this topic is by first of all talking briefly about some of the important concepts. Now, usually most of the webinars which, which I conduct, I jump directly into the questions and I use questions to help you understand all the concepts. But I feel that to be able to do well or to be able to follow this session, uh, it makes sense to uh, first of all give you a little bit of basic definition. Uh, if you're aware of it, well and good. But if you don't know how to calculate the total factors or if you're not comfortable with uh, how to write down, you know, um, uh, set up equations on factors and multiples, uh, it would be a little difficult for you to solve most of the questions. So I'll be spending about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Again, this is a very short introduction. Uh, obviously, if I want to discuss all of this, it might it may, I would need uh, you know uh, more than two two hours to uh, to just go through the all the all the all this concept. But I'll give you enough so that you can uh, either try these questions on your own, or at least when I'm discussing the questions, you would be able to at least recognize the formulas or the equations. Uh, that I will be setting up. Uh, once I have discussed this at a high level, uh, then I'm going to divide my questions into two to three different parts. I'll start off with basic questions on factors and multiples, which are applicable almost everywhere, be it primes, LCM, GCD, or divisibility. Then I'm going to uh, you know, deep dive, uh, get into some specific kind of questions, uh, one of them being total factors. Uh, again, while discussing total factors, I'll again show you a few examples apart from the formula so that you understand how to apply total factors and then we'll obviously solve one question on it 
And uh, lastly, I would be covering a few questions on LCMGCD. Now, uh, I'm sure most of you might have done LCMGCD somewhere in your school life. Uh, you may understand how to find out the LCM or the GCD of two numbers. But in GMAT, you'll get a lot of questions which uh, based on factors and multiples where variables would be involved. Like I, uh, that you might be comfortable finding the LCM of 1015 or the GCD of 1015. But if I tell you the, you know, if the LCM of X in 10 is uh, say, 60 uh, can you figure out what are the various values of x and so on uh, so forth those kind of questions so um uh, and some of the questions are difficult just to let you know uh, i have uh, tried to balance it uh, i'll be discussing about seven questions today uh, out of which uh, three to four would be uh, would be close to 700 level uh, but again when, whenever i'm discussing those kind of questions i'll ensure that i give you a lot of background a lot of other examples that uh, can help you follow uh, the, the difficult question that we would be discussing. Okay, so uh, with this, uh, let's jump right into the concept parts. Uh, let's try and understand uh, what are primes, factors, multiples, and everything. Uh, um, as always, whenever I uh, do any quant session, I always tell you the one of the prerequisites of doing well in a quant question is to ensure that you know all your concepts. If your concepts are weak, uh, obviously you won't be able to under solve any questions. So uh, let's understand three def main definitions which are like really important for you to uh, follow factors and multiples. One obviously is understanding what are prime numbers. Okay. Uh, now, can anyone tell me uh, from where do prime numbers start? Do they start from one or do they start from two, three? Uh, what was the first prime number? Anyone? Uh, the definition is on this on your screen, so you can use that definition also to try and uh, figure out the answer. Okay, Sejal says two. Everyone says two. Good, great. Uh, so uh, at, the, at least this thing is good that you're not confused between one and two. I've seen a few cases where people do get confused between one, whether it starts from one or two. But yes, it's correct that all prime numbers would uh, start from two. Uh, interesting fact is that obviously this is the only even prime number post that all prime numbers are odd. Okay. Uh, definition wise, uh, why are these called prime numbers? Because these are divisible by exactly two factors. Okay. These factors are basically distinct. Uh, what do I mean by that is that if I look at two, two would be divisible by two only and two would be divisible by one, nothing else. Same goes for any odd prime number. If I take seven, seven is divisible by one and seven is divisible by itself. Since these numbers are exactly divisible by two numbers, one and itself, that's why these are considered as prime numbers. So that's the easiest definition. Uh, by the way, whenever you're dealing with uh, pure play uh, questions which are based on prime numbers, uh, then uh, uh, then keep in mind that there are mostly two different categories of questions that you may get in the exam based on prime numbers. Uh, one is testing you know, uh, the concept of even odd primes. Uh, so you may get a uh, 600 level uh, questions. They're very, really difficult questions on these, but you can expect 600 level questions on even and odd primes. Like for example, uh, uh, you might be given something like this, that X plus Y is, you know, uh, 15. Uh, again, th this is like a 500 level question, but just to put my idea across, uh, X and Y are prime numbers, okay? Or you might get something like this, three to the power X plus one is prime. Okay, what is the value of X? Now, these are questions which are based on this concept of even or not. So whenever you get a question which are just asking whether it is prime or not, or whether they're just telling you it is prime, a particular uh, number is prime or something like that, always try to think in the gen general definition of primes, okay? But apart from that, also make sure uh, to focus, if, if the general definition is not fitting in somewhere, these questions are definitely would be solved using the concept of even or not, okay? So uh, that's very important to keep in mind because I've seen sometimes uh, people getting confused. Okay, what concept of prime should I use? So that is the idea. That is how you need to start thinking, either generic definition or even on primes. And then obviously the other kind of questions are which we will discuss are based on factors, like how many total factors does it have? How many even factors does it have? Uh, numbers that have only the total number of factors are odd. Those kind of questions are there. Uh, so a very clear cut segregation between these two. So you would know whenever you get a question, which one to apply when. Uh, the second obviously is factors. Now, what do I mean by factor? In fact, let me bring both the definitions together, factors and multiples, uh, because I think it's very important for uh, you to understand this uh, directly. And let me do one thing. Let me draw a number line out here uh, to um, to talk about it. Let's Let's take the number six. Okay, now can anyone tell me what are the factors of six? Factors or devices, these are uh, these are used interchangeably, by the way. So uh, can anyone tell me 
what are the factors of six? Okay, so Hazel has given us the answer, uh, which is one, two, three, six. Okay, so whenever you're looking at factors, that's very good. Factors are numbers which are either less. Uh, by the way, keep in mind, uh, whenever we talk about factors, uh, you will not be, you should not worry about positive, uh, negative factors, okay? Uh, negative factors will not come in the exam. Uh, negative factors are not tested. GMAT will very clearly, most of the cases will mention that you're dealing with positive factors or divisors. Even if they are not saying anything, uh, don't worry. You will not, you don't have to worry about minus one, minus two, minus three, all those stuff. Always worry about positive factors, okay? So a best way to remember, because I've seen people getting confused between these two and not sure how to set up the equation. So best way to remember is that a factor would be a number which would either be equal to or less than the given number. So if I say that x, the way it is written here, x is a factor of y. Okay. Now when I say x is a factor, the first thing that you should come in mind is that the number x, which is a factor or a divisor, has to be either less or equal to y. Okay, and factors are basically numbers which divide the original number. So the six is divisible by three. 6 is divisible by 2, 6 is divisible by 1, 6 is divisible by 6. So if you are given information that x is a factor of y, the equation that you need to set up is y upon x. Why y upon x? Because x is a small number. And when, when the factor divides the original number, then, then you get an integer because it's completely divisible. That is why when we set up the equation, we set up the equation like this. y by x is equal to integer or y by x is equal to k or y is equal to k times x. Okay. So keep in mind, this is very important because a lot of times people read the question stem, but they don't know how to translate it. What equation to set up when I read such a, such a, such a, you know, statement, this is how you need to set up it, set it up. Okay. Now tell me, these are factors. You have understood factors are less or equal. What about multiples? If I, if I uh, need to talk about multiples, uh, how do I define them? Multiples of six, for example. Can anyone tell me what are the multiples of six? Okay, multiples of six are numbers which are divisible by six and there are obviously infinite. That's a very important point that you have touched, Sezel, which I wanted to talk about next. But uh, again, easy way to remember is that numbers which are obviously would be higher than uh, six and they would be, uh, you know, divisible by six. So six, 12, 18, 24, and so on and so forth. And there's no end to it. If you notice, there will never be any end to it. And Keep in mind factors, divisors, multiples. Whenever we are talking about these, we'll always be talking about uh, positive factors, positive multiples every time. Okay. And important thing is uh, some people start uh, like uh, uh, Amira, you have mentioned 12, 36, 30, 54, which I can see. That's correct. But keep in mind uh, whenever I'm talking about factors of six, okay, I include six in it, right? One, two, three, and six. Similarly, when I'm talking about multiples, I'll always start from six, the number six, okay? And then move on, you know, to the higher multiple, six, 12, 24, 36, so on and so forth. Important thing to note, which uh, Sejal mentioned is that when we when you look at factors, okay? Factors are always limited. Okay, if you notice that I have limited number of factors. So a particular number will have a specific finite number of factors, okay? But when it comes to multiples, there's no end to it. Okay, for uh, so I can keep on writing as many multiples as I want to. Okay, so whenever you get a question on multiple in the exam, there'll always be certain constraint given in that question. Uh, certain, uh, like for example, they'll ask you how many factors between 50 and 250, uh, in, sorry, how many multiples between 50 and 250 do blah, 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 blah. Okay, so they'll put some um, constraint within the, uh, uh, within the question that can help you find out finite number of solutions. Okay, and see, notice out here that these numbers, 12, 18, 24, how are they written? 24 is what? 6 times 4, right? 6 times 3. So if I say x is a multiple of y, okay? x is a multiple of y, that means x can be expressed in terms of y. So basically the role kind of switches if you notice. 
okay but what is important is that in the exam if you end up forgetting what to do how to set up the equation x by y or y by 6 you can very quickly write one example and understand here like for example if i forget i can see okay 12 by 6 is an integer so i need to if i'm if if x if x is a multiple of y this would be my x this would be my y and i can set up my equation if 3 is a factor of uh, you know uh, 6 if x is a factor of y again then i know that y by x is equal to some integer k so if at any point of time variables confuse you you can always take the simple example to set up your equation and then go about solving the question okay uh, i hope this was helpful i hope this is perfectly clear and uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask, else I will move on to the next part of the lesson. Okay. Okay, I don't see any questions in the chat box, so I'll move ahead. Uh, in case you have any questions, please feel free to ask, and I will take it up uh, once I'm done with this part. Okay. Now, uh, one of the questions that uh, you would come um, across in factors multiples is uh, how to find out the uh, total factor of a number okay so when i was dealing with six remember in the previous slide we talked about uh, one one two three and six uh, zero is is a multiple of every number because zero can be a b root can be expressed as zero is k times uh, something but we will not be considering it in in case of g mat whenever we'll be solving the questions as i mentioned we'll always be working on the assumption that we are talking about positive multiples and positive factors okay i hope that answers your query Abhiru. now coming to this part total factors see keep in mind that uh, when i was whenever i was writing down the factors okay when i was dealing with six i could very easily write one two three and six these are the four factors okay and i had to manually find this out that there are four factors of six interesting thing to note that whenever i'm talking about factors one of the factors is always one one of the factors is always the number itself okay and the other factors that are that are there they are always obviously of uh, this might seem obvious but just want to clarify it they'll be in, in between one and n so there are two and three okay now whenever you're dealing with small numbers it is pretty easy you can always uh, you know manually count it but let's say if i give you a, a such a, a say a huge number like 456 or something like that now i cannot manually write it right i cannot manually try to write down one 456 and then try and find out what are the factors in between Okay, because that's going to take a lot of time. I don't even know how many of them are there. Uh, there could be some other number who's, uh, for example, that might have 20 factors. I cannot sit down and write down all those 20 factors. Okay, no, it doesn't make sense to do that. So just to find uh, to find out the total factors, what we do is we usually uh, use the formula to uh, find out the answer. Now, how do I do it is I'm going to explain with the help of this example. Uh, in fact, I have two examples. I'll, uh, I'll take up the first one and then move on to the next one. Uh, so, for example, if I want to find out how many factors does 120 have? Okay. Once again, I can uh, I can write 120 and I can manually start finding it. 1 times 120, 2 times 60, 3 times, you know. Uh, and I can keep on doing it till the point I find out my answer, but not worth it. So what you basically do is you prime factorize 120, okay? So the, the thing that is that you can see here is that whatever your number is, you kind of break it down, you keep on breaking it down till you can write the 120 in terms of its prime factor. So for example, if I break down 120, I can write it as 2 cubed, times 3 to the power 1 times 5 to the power 1 and notice very carefully that all of these needs to be prime okay so for example i cannot just break it like 12 times 10 and just leave it okay or i cannot write it separately i cannot keep two square here two here i need to club all similar prime numbers together and then write it as in this form which we call as basically call as prime factorization after prime factorization you write it in this form where each prime number and their powers are mentioned now, the, the next part, which is the easy part, is when, once you're able to prime factorize it, all you need to do is take up these powers, okay? And uh, please keep in mind, we are taking the powers, okay? You take up these power, you add one to these powers, and you multiply it to get the total factors. So it would be three plus one times one plus one times one plus one, which will give you 16. Again, keep in mind that in our video lessons, we have shown all of this clearly how to, why are we using this formula and everything. But again, I cannot go too much deep into it at this point of time. So I want you to remember that whenever you're trying to find out the total factors of any number, what you need to do is prime factorize it, write it in this form, then take up these powers, add one to it, multiply them to get the total factors, okay? 
if you have any questions guys please feel free to ask okay now can anyone tell me how many how do i find out the total factors of 13 what do i do easy question but uh, i want your take on it if i have to use the formula what would i do One in thirteen, which is which you, which you're finding manually, okay. But if I have to use the formula, then understand that thirteen is thirteen to the power one. Let's say I don't want to write it down. One in thirteen. How do I use the formula? The formula without using the formula, you can say okay, thirteen is already prime factorized. You cannot break it any further, okay. There's no chance of breaking. It. It's a prime number. So you'll simply write it as thirteen to the power one, and then when you're finding the total factors, it would simply be one plus one, which is equal to two, which you can obviously manually find it out, okay. Now, in the exam, if there are easy questions, obviously you can use this formula to get the answer directly. But unfortunately, there are difficult questions where they might give you the total factors and ask you to figure out the number. Okay. And in fact, I have one question like this, similar to this. So we are going to discuss that too. Now, coming to one final lesson before we move into the uh, the questions with LCM and GCD. Now, uh, again, I'm just trying to show you uh, how to find these out here. Uh, the higher applications, when you come to the higher applications of these questions, I'll go to, deep into it also. Don't worry about it. Now, when it comes to finding LCM or GCD, whatever you do, you always need to prime factorize each number. Okay. So if you have 24, 24 is 2 cubed times 3 to the power 1. 36 is 2 square, 3 square. And 80 obviously is 2 to the power 4 times 5. Okay. Now, whenever you're trying to find out the LCM, see, understand, uh, this is where the definition helps you understand what you need to do. What am I looking for? I'm looking for the smallest, which is the lowest, common. When I say common, I, that means it has to be common to all of three of them, and it has to be a multiple, okay? Now, if you remember the diagram, 6, 12, 24, 18, whatever, 18, 24. Now, these numbers, these are the multiples. And these multiples are divisible by the original number, right? We wrote it like this, 12 by 6 is an integer. So if I'm looking for the lowest common multiple, what am I looking for? I'm looking for a number, okay? I'm looking for a number n that should be divisible by 24, that should be divisible by 36, and that should be divisible by 80. Okay, it should be divisible by all three of them. Now, if I want them to be divisible by all three of them, Okay, if n should be divisible by 24, then obviously I need to ensure that it has 2 and 3 in it. Okay, I'm I'll come to the powers, but it, it needs to have 2 and 3 in it, right? If I want n to be divisible by 80, it needs to have a 5 in it, it needs to have a 2 in it. If it doesn't have a 5, it doesn't have a 2, then obviously it won't be divisible, right? The prime, prime factor, obviously, again, I'll come to the power later on. But I'm talking that I need to have, a, to make sure that n is divisible by all three of them, I need to ensure that I consider each prime number. I need to ensure that my uh, my LCM has all these prime numbers. So I need to have two. I need to have, uh, let me write it here. I need to have two. I need to have three. I need to have five in my LCM. Now, once again, if I need it to be divisible, n should have the highest power, right? n should have two to the power four. If it doesn't have two to the power four, think about it in this way. If I take my n as 2 cube times 3 to the power 1 times say 5 to the power 1. Let's say hypothetically, okay? Will it be divisible? No, right? Because 80 has 2 to the power 4 in it. So I won't be able to divide it. So to ensure that n is completely divisible, I need to ensure that I have the highest power of all the prime numbers. If I have the highest power of all the prime numbers, I will not need to worry about anything at all. So I'll take up the highest powers. In fact, I think I have it here with me, yeah. So 2 to the power 4, 3 square, 5 to the power 1 is 720. Okay, this is the explanation rational behind doing it. In the exam, you don't need to remember all of this. You just need to remember prime factorize the number, take each prime number that's important and the respective powers, highest powers. If you follow these steps, you will be able to find out your LCM easily. Okay, if you have any questions, once again, please feel free to ask. Uh, I'll be more than happy to answer. When it comes to GCD, okay, what am I looking for? I'm looking for a divisor. Okay. So once again, focus on the diagram. These are divisors. Divisors do what? Divisors divide the number completely. Okay. So if I take up this example again, 24, 36, 80, 
I have these three. Okay. Now, what am I looking for? I'm looking for a number divisor, basically what it divides the number. Okay. So I'm looking for a number which divides 24. I'm looking for a number which divides 36. I'm looking for a number which divides 80. Okay. Divides. Now ask yourself, should I take all the prime numbers? Can anyone tell me, does it make sense to take all the prime numbers? Should I consider two, three, five, all of it in my number? Yes, no. Does it make sense to take in N two, three, five, consider all prime numbers? Okay. So they're saying no. Mridula is also saying no. Mridula, okay. Correct. Because see, thinking if I take two, three, five, all of it, then I won't be able to divide it, right? Uh, if I take two, three, five, again, I'm not again focusing on the powers, but let's say if I take it the smallest power also, if I take all of them, then what, what is happening is that uh, if I take case of 36, if I have five in the denominator, I won't be able to cancel out, right? So in this case, I have to look for numbers for N, which, which are common, all three numbers. So in this case, I only take the common prime factors something which is common. If it is common in all three of them, then it will be able to divide it. And I need to take the lowest power. I cannot take the highest. And the same example can be thought in this way. If I take the highest power, if I take two to the power four, it won't divide 36. So if I want to take, uh, so the only, uh, so if I have to make sure that it is divisible, I have to take whatever is common, in the prime number, which is common in all three of them. And if I want to make sure that it is completely, it completely divides all three number, I have to take the smallest power, which ensures that each number gets divided. So notice the major difference out here in these two okay one major difference is that i in lcm i take all each prime number unique prime number here i only take the common one in lcm though the name is lowest common multiple i end up taking the highest power okay in case of greatest i take the lowest power so this is the way i ask people to remember that you need to just do the opposite in case you forget in the exam just remember if it's the greatest you need to take the smallest powers that's all but the rational reasoning i hope it is perfectly clear uh, um, as mentioned before, there's one or two more things that are needed for you to do well in LCM GCT, but I'll come to that later on. Okay. For now, I uh, just want to just uh, let you know that if you want to go more in depth, uh, understand about factors, multiples, prime numbers, total factors, uh, this is uh, available on our uh, free trial. Uh, so anyone who wants to look at the you know, Prime's video lesson completely end to end and all the lessons are there. It's not that it's partial. You can watch all the Prime's video lesson on our platform for free. Uh, it's included in our free trial. So I'm sharing the link. If anyone wants to go through it, uh, I would highly recommend looking at it. Uh, okay. Um, now with this, uh, we have come to the end of our uh, first part of our discussion on theory. Whatever I've told you now should be enough for you to solve the next three to four questions. Whenever, as I told you, if I feel there's anything else that needs to be added or to uh, that I need to teach you, I'll definitely do that. Okay, so with this, here's the first question, guys. Uh, try and solve with whatever we have discussed. Keep in mind that once you, I'll, I'll give you about one and a half, two minutes to do this question. And once I feel that you have enough time, I'll let you know I'll tell you to post your answers. So don't just post your answers immediately. Right? Solve the question. Keep the answer to yourself. Once I tell you to post the answer, then only do so. Okay. This one's an easy one. So I'll give you one and a half minute for this one. Uh, you can start posting your answers. Okay, I have a C, B, B, two Bs, okay. 
I'll wait for another 10, 15 seconds and then I'll start the discussion. Okay, any more responses? Okay, I have one more response. Avijit also says it's uh, B. Okay, uh, great. Uh, B is the correct answer. The question is simple, but there are still a lot of learnings in this question, some tangential learning, which I would want to uh, teach you uh, while solving this question. Okay, now there are a number of, way, number of ways to do this question. One is you can use the options. Um, the other is that you go and solve the question in a proper, you know, uh, methodical way. You're finding out prime factorizing and then solving the question and we'll look at both the ways uh, to solve it now one important question which a lot of people ask me is that hey i don't know when to apply gcd when to apply lcm uh, how should i understand that so the, the advice that i give is that look at the keywords that are given in the question stem for example if you see the word divisor divisor of two numbers given to you okay there's an in, that's an indication that you may be look try you may need to find out the gcd greatest common divisor Okay, so if you see the word divisor of this and this, your first step could be to find out the greatest common divisor. I'm not saying that is what is being asked, but that could be your first step to solve the question. Okay, so in this case, it's simply given that the integer n is a divisor of 72 and 90. Notice the word greatest is not given here. Okay, the word greatest is not given, but don't panic. Even if this is given, you can still find out the GCD and I'll tell you why you can do that. Okay. Um, I'll come to the level, second part of the question later on because that is needed once I'm done with this discussion. Okay. Ideally, you should read it completely and mark it down, mark all your information in the piece of paper. But for now, for this discussion, I am just working on the first part of the, uh, the question step. So I have 72. Okay. So I will prime factorize 72. 72 is 8 times 9. So I can write it as uh, 3 square, uh, 2 cube times 3 square. Okay. If I look at 90, 90 is 2 to the power 1, uh, 3 square times 5 to the power 1. Okay, so I have 90 out here. Now, if since I have the word divisor is given, what you can do is you can go ahead and find out the divisor. By the way, keep in mind if again, if you have forgotten what a divisor is, draw the diagram and then ask yourself, okay, divisors are numbers which are which divides the number completely. So I'm looking for numbers which are smaller or equal to. Okay. How do I find out the divisor? I've already told you in divisor, we find we take the common prime. So two and three is present in both of them. So I'll take that. Okay. Once I've taken two and three, I need to take the smallest power. For so two, for two, I'll take two to the power one. For three, I'll take three square, uh, three square. And that gives me the GCD as 18. Okay. Now, luckily, in this case, uh, GCD 18 turns out to be an answer. But uh, after finding out the GCD, keep in mind that this is one of the one of the numbers. Okay, my n, which is the number that is a divisor of 72 and 90. Okay, my n could be 18. That's fine. But that's the greatest number. And as I told you, the word greatest is not given here. So what are the other numbers that divide 72 and 90? So another learning that you need to keep in mind is that factors of the GCD will also divide the original number. Okay. What do I mean by that is that, see, what are the factors of 18? I have 1, 18, 2, 9, 3, 6. These are the factors of 18, right? Now, uh, I see, I'll come to that question. Don't worry. Okay, I'll come to your question. Now, these are factors of 18. And notice all these factors, obviously, 18 contains 6. So if 72 is divisible by 80, 70 and 9, they'll also be divisible by 6. If it is divisible by 18, it will also be divisible by 9. Okay. So in this case, n can take all these values. Okay. Please remember, n can take all these values. Now, only when I look at this, the second part of the question stem, which says that n has to be between 9 and 30, I'll say, okay, if n has to be greater than 90 and less than 30, that is why my value of n has to be 18. It cannot take any of these values. Okay. I hope it is clear why I'm not taking 1, 2, 3, 6, and 9. Okay, because I'm looking for the value of n. Now, if the question stem would have been, let's say, if the question would have been, Instead of this, if I would have told you how many values of n are possible, 
Okay. If I would have asked you how many values of n are possible, then I'm talking about all possible values. So if you just find 18, and if you say, for example, one of the answer op options is one, and if you end up marking one as your answer, that would be incorrect. What you need to remember is if the word greatest is not given, then you need to find out the GCD, that's step one. And then you need to find out the total factors, total uh, factors of 18. Now, obviously I did it here manually. I, I manually found this out. You don't need to do that. Just simply find out the total factors. We just learned how to do it. 18 is what? Two to the power one times three square. So total factor, how would I find out? I'll take the power, add one to it. I'll take the power, add one to it and multiply it and get my answer six. So I'll say there are six possible values of n. Okay, is this clear everyone? Please just a yes, no. Any questions that you have, please ask in the chat box. But learning wise, these are the two learnings that I wanted to give you. Number one, if you're confused what to do, LCM or GCD, look for the keyword divisor factor multiple. That will help you understand whether you need to find out the GCD or LCM. If the word greatest is not given, don't worry about it. Simply find out you know, the GCD. Once you find out the GCD, post that, see what is given. If they are asking you how many values, then find out the total factors, get it done with it. If they are asking for an actual value of n, then they will give you certain constraints in the question, like the way I gave 9, 9 and 30. Okay. Now coming to your question, uh, Asim, uh, remember that uh, I talked about in the previous slide that uh, to find out the GCD, I need to ensure I just take the common prime factors. If I Because that number has to divide, that number has to divide all three numbers. Now, if I take five also in my GCD, okay, I'm looking for a number which divides both of them. Okay, don't forget that. So if I include five in it, will 72 be divisible by five? It won't be, right? It won't be divisible. That is why I'm not considering five in my GCD. I need to consider only the common ones and the smallest power. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Uh, and Sammy, this belongs to a 600 level question, close to 600. Okay, so the correct answer in this case is B. If they would have asked you total factors, the answer would have been six. So I don't see any more questions in the chat box. So I am moving on to the next question. Here's the next one. And for this one, I'll give you two minutes. Uh, it means for divisor, we have to consider GCD. Yes, we have to consider GCD. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by not else. But for divisor, we need to consider GCD. And then from there, we need to find out the other devices if you have to. So I found out the GCD as an 18. And then I found out the other devices like this. Okay, either you do it manually or use the total factors formula. Guys, I would wait you uh, before posting an answer. I'll tell you when you need to post it, okay? We are still, I want to give you 30 seconds. Guys, please wait, wait, wait. Now that you're posting it, post it, but for the next question, please wait. I'll tell you when to post your answers, okay? Okay, I can see that uh, two of you think the answer should be D. I have a A, I have a B. Okay, I'll wait for another 15 seconds. Uh, anyone else? Okay, Susan says D. Sigil says A, D. Okay, so uh, I can see that the confusion is between A and D. In fact, this question has been created based on A and D trap only. Okay, uh, B, uh, unfortunately, is not the answer. The, uh, the confusion, ideally, if there should be any, should be between A and D only. And this confusion will arise because of the fact of factors and multiples. If you're not, you know, comfortable with LCM, GCD, how to write down the factors, then uh, there's going to be a problem. Now, uh, let me tell you how you should go about solving the question. In fact, I've already told you in the first question what you need to do. Uh, as far as the... The question stem is concerned, it's fairly easy. There's not a lot of information given. We are just told that n is an integer, which is fair enough. 
okay and i need to find out that whether n is a multiple of 80 or not okay whether it is a multiple of 80 now if n is a multiple of 80 that means again remember uh, 80 is here if something is a multiple of 80 then that number can be written as 80 times k something like this so if you want to visualize it you should be able to visualize set up the equation like this that n has to be 80 times so 80 uh, 160 240 so on so forth you can think even those terms with this you should move on to the first statement now i already told you look for the keywords if you see the word divisor find out gcd if you look for if you see the word multiple of something and something then you can uh, try and find out the lcm right so here what can i see i can see the word multiple n is a multiple of 5 and 16 right now obviously when i find out the lcm i am finding out the lowest value it doesn't mean that n has to be that but i can be 100 percent sure that bare minimum n has to be that much bare minimum okay so what i'll do is i'll, I'll prime factorize 5 which again is 5 to the power 1 only you cannot do anything here you prime factorize 16 which will give you 2 to the power 4 and when you find out the lcm Obviously, you'll have to take both the prime numbers in LCM. Remember, we take all the prime numbers and we take their highest powers. So here, when I multiply, I get the LCM as 80. What does this mean? That means if n is a multiple of 5 and 16, the minimum value of n has to be 80, but n can be higher multiples also. So n can be 80, 160, 240, so on, so forth. Or in short, that we have written it here, that n can be written as 80 times k. Okay. Keep in mind, there's no end to the multiple thing also because I've just told multiple, so it can be any multiple as we discussed. There's no end to it. But this finding of the LCM helps you understand what could be the smallest value. So the question is, is n a multiple of 80? Since the minimum value is 80, and after that, all values obviously are multiple of 80, I can say yes, n is definitely a multiple of 80. There's no question of it not being. Okay. Now, the second statement is a typical trap statement. When you notice 8 and 10, you feel high A, it's a multiple of 8, it's a multiple of 10. So it's a multiple of 8 times 10, 80. And then you end up saying that this is also sufficient, which is where you falter. Okay. Once again, see the word multiple. So what you do is you find out the lowest common multiple. So you take 8, you prime factorize it. Okay. You take 10, you prime factorize it. And then you say that the LCM in this case is going to be, again, 2 and 5 would be there. The highest power of 5 is 1. And the highest power out of this is 3. This gives you 40. Okay. So if n is a multiple of 8 and 10, then n can, can be 40 also. Okay. So in this case, n is a multiple of 40. So it can be 40, it can be 80, it can be 160, so on and so forth. Okay, but you're not sure what is the exact value in this case. And if you're wondering why am I focused on the exact value? Because if n turns out to be 40, so the question is, is n a multiple of 80? My answer would be no, it's not a multiple of 80. If n turns out to be 80, then I would say yes, it is a multiple of 80. So here from statement two, I'm getting two contradictory answers. That n could be 40, which makes it which is which makes it not a multiple of 80. If n is something else like 80, 160, blah, 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 then it would be a multiple of 80. So since, so in this case, if I have to write it down, I'll write n like this, n is 40 times k, okay, not 80 times k, okay? So since I'm getting two different answers out here, I'll say this is not sufficient. So the answer here is statement two is not sufficient, statement one is sufficient. So the correct answer in this case is going to be option A. Okay, is this clear? And by the way, I hope through this example, you also understand how to set up the uh, equation. Like if I see n is a multiple of 8 and 10, how do I express n? You find out the LCM and then you write LCM times some integer k. Okay. In GCD, what did you learn? If you see a divisor, find out the GCD and then find out all the other factors. In LCM, find out the LCM and then express it something times k. If there are any questions, any doubts, please feel free to ask. I hope with these two examples, uh, it, it, I hope it gave you some direction on how to approach these questions of factors and multiples. Any questions? Everything clear? Okay, I don't see question in the chat box, so I will move on to the next question. By the way, guys, if you are enjoying this webinar, I would recommend you to kindly like this video. Uh, it would help us reach a more number of people. 
So, okay, I can see a question here is what is the, uh, the, the previous question that you had here is again a 600, 650 level question. Closer to 650, I would say, because of the trap of A and D, but it's still within 600, 650. Okay. Okay, here's your next question, guys. This one also, I'll give you two minutes. Once again, once you're done with the question, please wait. I'll let you know once two minutes are up and then we can start off the discussion. Guys, you can start posting your responses. Uh, I can see a few questions in the chat box. I'll take them up quickly. Uh, Susan, unfortunately, there is uh, no, you know, um, sh faster way. Uh, you have to find out the numbers which are divisible by six or eight. So I'll have to find all the numbers which are divisible by six from uh, one to 200, okay? And you need to find out all the numbers that are divisible by 8 from 1 to 200. And then find out all the numbers that are divisible by both 6 and 8, which is 24. All the numbers which are divisible by 24 and then subtract it. So what Asim is saying is actually correct. You find out all the numbers which are divisible by 6. Now, uh, a quick uh, tip or trick, whatever you want to call is, that if you want to find out how many numbers are divisible by 6, you simply divide 600, uh, 200, 200 by 6. Okay you divide 200 by six and find out the quotient. So I can take here 18, 33, right? So I can say there are 33 numbers, six times one till six times 33. So there are 33 numbers which are divisible by six. Same you need to do for eight, same you need to do for 24, okay? So whatever you get here, whatever you get from eight, you add that up and subtract the 24 number of times that you get 24. Uh, if you have time at the end, I'll take up this question and show you elaborately, but that is how you need to do. It. There are three divisions involved and one addition subtraction involved. That is like the bare minimum that you have to do every time. Okay. Uh, Duncan, yes, the video will be uploaded. Uh, you can, once once the session ends, you should be able to look at the recording if you have missed some part of it. Okay, I can see uh, uh, most of you are saying A. Uh, and I can see 1D. Okay, good. I, I, I Most of you got the question correct. And I'm glad to see that you are able to do this question, which is based on variable. And some people might not be comfortable with it. But uh, if the question is asking is A of factor of B, okay? I know I'm jumping. Let me just read it quickly. A and B are integers. They're both greater than 1. So they are positive integers greater than 1, right? So if, if I'm being asked is A a factor of B, okay? B is here. A should be a factor of B, then that means they are asking whether B by A is an integer or not, right? How many of you use this concept to solve the question, is B by A is equal to an integer or is B by A is equal to K? This is something that we discussed a while back. Did you use this to solve the question? Yes, no. Always remember to do pre-analysis also, okay? So if you just set up the equation, like this, if A is a factor of B, that, that means I'm looking for B by A is equal to K, then I, while solving the, uh, you know, uh, the equations that are given in the question stem, I will try my best to write it in that form, okay? So I need to somehow prove B by A is some integer. With that in mind, I'll go to my first statement. First statement is A square 
plus a minus b is equal to 0. Now, I need the form of b by a as an integer. So what I'll do is I'll take b to one side. I'll write it as a squared plus a. OK, I can take a common also. I'll get a plus 1. And then I need b by a, so divide a both sides. So you'll end up getting, oops, my bad, one sec, guys. Yeah. So you end up getting b by a is equal to a plus 1. A is an integer, so obviously a plus 1 is also an integer. So here you can clearly see that you are getting b by a is an integer. So this statement turns out to be sufficient. So as you can see, if I know how to set up my equation, what I have for factors and multiples, I'll know how to, you know, what I'm trying to look for. A lot of people here end up taking values in solving this question. This doesn't make sense. If some of you did that, I hope you can appreciate the variable way also, which is quite quite fast. Okay. And if I use the same methodology in the second statement, so my answer now would be either A or D, okay, uh, which is, I think, the confusion, main confusion. Uh, here, there is a slight problem. The problem is that uh, if I, uh, same thing, take B here and write it like this. In fact, let me take A common from here. Now, if I divide both sides by AK, because I need B by A, okay, so k and k would get cancelled out and I'll be left with b by a is equal to a plus 1 by k. Now I know a plus 1 is an integer, that's fine. I know k is an integer, but do I know whether this fraction that I have here, a plus 1 by k, whether this is an integer or a fraction, that is something that I don't know. That's a big question mark out here. I don't know whether it's an integer or a fraction. Okay, and since I don't know whether it is an integer or a fraction, I will not be able to answer my question because I need to prove that b by a is an integer, and that is something which I'm not able to do. Okay, so this statement would turn out to be not sufficient. So those of you who would have marked b at the answer, you might have just thought about integer by integer or a plus k by k would be an integer. You have made that assumption. If you did something like that, then you fell for the trap. Okay, you just thought k is an integer, so it will get cancelled out. If you, is that the thought process that you used? Those of you mark D, did you fall for this kind of a trap? That you thought, okay, if, if they're giving k as an integer, I will get everything as an integer. But I hope it's clear why uh, statement 2 is not sufficient, statement 1 is. So the correct answer in this case will turn out to be option A. Okay. Uh, Aziz, you can write it. That's not a problem. That is also totally fine. You can write it like this and infer from, from here only. That's not a problem. You can definitely do it. I, I hope that you're talking about statement one. So you can definitely do that. If that is the way you want to think, A times K, that is definitely fine. But obviously here I cannot do it, right? Because I have a K here. I have K times B is equal to A times A plus one. Okay. Okay, guys, with this, let's move on and let's move on to a new topic, which is an important one, which is questions on total factors. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the question directly, okay, with a little hint, a small hint, and uh, you try it out. I'll give you about two and a half minutes to do this one because this is slightly on the difficult side. Uh, and then I'll give you some more background on this topic before solving this question, okay? So here's the question on your screen. The hint that I would want to give you is that if I, if I write down, you can listen to the hint. That's not a problem. You'll understand what this hint means later on. Now, six has these four factors, okay? Okay, uh, Aziz, I'll come to your query. Let, let me just query, quickly complete this, okay? Six is basically one, two, three, and six. So I can say six has three positive factors greater than one, okay? It has three positive factors greater than one. So if I want to find out the total factors, I can I can say the total number of factors is three plus one, four factors, okay? So I hope this part is clear. And guys, please wait. I will, I'm giving you two and a half minutes, complete it and then post your answers, okay? Uh, 
Aziz, I'm not sure what do you mean by uh, we can assume that k could be equal to a. Yeah, it could be equal to k. It could not be equal to k. It could be any other value also. So not sure how that is going to help us out. Because we are not trying to prove that k is Okay, yeah, then that's correct. If k is equal to a, then I'll get b is equal to a plus one and b by a won't be an integer. Yes, you can definitely do that, not a problem. Okay, I now understood what you meant. That is absolutely correct. You can use that reasoning. Okay, guys, you can start posting your responses. Those of you are done. Okay, I can see two A's. What about the others? Okay, Amira thinks it should be B. Nikhil thinks it should be A. Okay. Since we don't know if three is included within one of the factors, uh, that's a fair reasoning. Okay, a lot of A's. Okay. Okay, so let's very quickly discuss this. Now notice, uh, I was talking about these kind of questions where you would be given the total factors, either directly or indirectly. Here I gave it indirectly, uh, but you would be given total number of factors and then you might be asked about, you know, some other total factors of some other number, or you may be asked to find out the actual number also. Okay, these kind of questions might come up. So I hope this part is clear to everyone now. What do I mean by that? So uh, if it could, uh, the question seems is fairly easy, so I'm not reading it. It's a positive integer. I just need to find out uh, how many total factors does n have? That's the question, total factors of n. Now, the first statement is n cube has exactly six positive factors greater than one, which means is that n cube has uh, factor number one, factor number two, factor number three, total factors six, which are greater than one. And I already told you that n cube obviously will have one of the factors as one. So if I have to write down what are the total number of factors, I will say that the total factors of n cube, okay, total factors of n cube is going to be six plus one, seven. There are total seven factors, okay. Now, in in GMAT, uh, you won't be getting a lot of questions with higher total factors, and then ask you to find something else. By the way, so whenever you get questions like these, the total factors would be either seven or you know um, any prime number maybe or you would be getting a total factors as five or four or three, things like that. Now, remember, uh, for the sake of discussion, I'm taking some uh, X, okay? Let's say X is a number, okay? And if I say that it's total factors, and this is a general discussion, okay? This is just to help you understand whenever you get questions like these, how to generally, uh, how to solve these in a generic way. So if I tell you the total number of factors is say seven in this case, which is given, you need to ask yourself, how am I getting the total factors? What do I do? Remember I told you how we find the total factors? We prime factorize it. 
you break it down into prime factors and then to find out my total factors what i do is i take these numbers prime numbers and i then add one to it and multiply it right that is what we do so when i say that the total factors is seven and i'm going to show you by the way two cases okay uh with these with the help of these two cases you should be you know we will be able to solve almost all the questions like these so this total factor it could be a prime number so like seven five six so i'm replacing this total factor with seven say for a moment okay and i don't know how many prime numbers are there i don't know i have no clarity about it so i'm just writing it out here like a plus one b plus one c plus one i don't know but think logically you have seven here can i break down seven it's a prime number i cannot break it down right there's no way of breaking it down into two different numbers like for example if i have total factors as four okay i know i can still break it down and write it as two times two but seven cannot be broken down and on my left hand side i have numbers which are product of you know two three terms but since i cannot break down seven you should be able to infer that there has to be only one uh, one uh, you know term on the right hand side so seven has to be equal to a plus one i cannot have seven is equal to a plus one times b plus one not possible because seven cannot be broken down i can write it as seven times one but it doesn't make sense okay because uh, i'll tell you why it doesn't make sense don't worry but let's look at this if i take seven is equal to a plus one i get a is equal to six okay now if i write seven as seven times one what do i get i'll compare it i'll say a plus one is equal to seven or a is equal to six i'll write b plus one is equal to one or b is equal to zero now what is our use of writing b is equal to zero think about it i write x is equal to p1 to the power a is six now if i write p2 to the power zero that is literally one only right anything to the power zero is one so in the end you'll end up getting this only x is equal to p1 to the power six is this part clear? This is crucial. So I'll pause here for a moment. If this is clear, please, you know, say yes, no, put it in the chat box. Any questions, feel free to ask. And I'm giving you, a, you know, a direct way, uh, a way to draw this inference. I've already told you what to do. So if you see a prime number, prime number cannot be broken down any further. If it cannot be broken down, you what your inference should be in the exam time when you're taking the test is that it has to be written as a plus one equal to that prime number. I cannot write a plus one times b plus one or anything like that not possible because breaking down doesn't hardly gives me anything so your number whatever that number is b it x y z can be written as x is equal to p1 to the power a if it is a prime number that is your inference and a is something that you'll get after solving it okay please let me know if this is clear a quick yes if this is clear okay great so prime numbers are clear right now come let's come to non prime which are composite now in case of composite uh, as i told you you won't get huge numbers you won't get a composite total factors as 16 or something like that uh, yes jenny it's a rule uh, the rule is and i discussed it at the start of the webinar is that you break down the numbers in terms of prime factors and then when you want to find out the total factors you just take the powers add one to it and multiply it to get the total factors so for example for 12 12 is 2 square times 3 to the power 1 so if i want to find out my total factors i'll take the power 2 plus 1 1 plus 1 and multiply it and get my answer okay now composite is very interesting and the way to remember is that composite for case of composite numbers there'll always be two cases okay there are always two cases okay all uh, a lot of people just take one of them i want you to understand that you can break it down into two cases one of the cases could be that your number n or number x since i'm writing it as x could be still in the form of x is equal to p1 to the power a it's possible for example i can write 4 is equal to just a plus 1 and i can get a is equal to 3 right so x would be p1 to the power 3 for example uh, i'm running out of space i'm writing on top right i hope you can see it like for example the number 8 Number eight is what? Two cube. If I want to find out the total factors of two cube, what would that be? Three plus one, four, right? 
So you could have numbers like these, prime number to the power three or something like that, as is, which will give you the result. Okay, that's case one. The case two is that four can actually be, this number can be broken down, can be written as two times two. And once it can be written as two, into two parts, two different parts, you can take a times one times, a, a plus one times b plus one. Okay, and then you equate it. A plus one is equal to two, so a is equal to one. B plus one is equal to two, or b is equal to one. And then you can say that x can be written as p one to the power one, p two two to the power one. Okay, these are the only two cases that can come. Now, why did I say that you won't get a composite number greater than you know six? The reason is if the number is say for example if i tell you the total factors is eight then there could be three cases you could have uh, you know x is equal to p1 to the power seven you could have x is equal to p1 uh, uh, to the power two into p2 to the power one you could have x is equal to p1 times p2 again you don't need to know it but I'm, what i'm trying to say is that the number of cases increases this won't come on the gmat you don't have to worry about it okay uh, you can be rest assured about it you will uh, if even if you get a composite number that composite number would either be four or a six Okay, uh, and if you get prime numbers in most of the cases, it would be two, three, five, seven. You can get higher prime numbers also because writing it is easy. But for composite, four and six is enough. Okay, now if this is clear, before I solve this question, can you very quickly tell me, very quickly, uh, in fact, I'll keep it here only. But the question that I'm asking is if, let's say if I have total factors as six, can you tell me how will I write it? What would be my two cases? Can you tell me like this? Uh, in terms of this, what will I write x as? What are the two cases that I'll write x as? If that is clear, if you're able to answer that question, then believe me, it's done. Uh, you should be able to solve these kind of questions easily. So if my total factors is six, what are my two cases? Just remember you one case would be where you need to write it as is. Six would be six only is equal to something. And then you need to break down six as two times three. Can anyone tell you what would be those two cases? Correct. We don't have to see, uh, Aziz, in this case, you won't have to. You won't get a question where total factors would be six. Don't worry about it. They won't give you something like that. You have to find out n to the power five. I got it. I got your question. Don't worry about it. Yes, I can see most of you are saying it now correctly, which is good. So the first case would be that you will take a plus one is equal to six or a is equal to five. And you can say x is equal to p1 to the power five. And the second case would be a plus one times b plus one is equal to three times two. So a is equal to two and b is equal to one. So x is equal to p1 square times p2 to the power 1. OK, this is what you need to remember for any, any questions like this, how you need to generalize it. And you should be able to get the answer very quickly. OK, so I hope this is clear. Let's move on to the statement very quickly, because now if this is clear, I can move on very quickly. So if n cube has six positive factors greater than one, then as I told you, the total factors in this case is seven. So I'll say n cube is n cubes total factor is seven now seven is a prime number so i know what can i do seven is equal to a plus one or a is equal to six so i'll say n cube can be written as p1 to the power six okay because that's the only way we can write it i showed you here my x in this case is n cube so n cube is p1 to the power six now take the cube root the positive number so you don't have to worry about it if you take the cube root you'll get n is equal to p1 square once you get n is equal to p1 square, you want to find out the total positive factors of n. You can obviously do it. You can say total factors is equal to 2 plus 1, which is equal to 3. See, easy. It didn't take us a lot of time because now, because we know this 
factor that how to write it down, how to get the answer. Those of you might not uh, be aware of this formula will take a lot of time to do such variable questions. But And this is, is a 700 plus level question, which after knowing this logic can be solved very quickly at the max two and a half minutes or two minutes. Now here, if I'm saying three positive factors greater than one, that means total factor is equal to four. Right? Total factor is four. And I've already told you how you can write total factor equal to four. So one of the way is that a plus one is equal to four or a is equal to three. So I can say three n, that is my number, is p1 to the power three. Okay, that is my case one. And my case two is three times n is equal to p1 to the power one times p2 to the power one. I'll pause here. If there's any confusion in this one, please feel free to ask. In the second case, I did this a plus one times b plus one is equal to two times two. So from here, I got p1 to the power one and p2 to the power one. Okay. Now here's how you do an, uh, draw an inference. So some of you can draw it very directly, but if I'm saying three times n is equal to one prime number, p1 cube, what can I infer about n? What is n? See, on the right-hand side, you have just one prime number. On the left-hand side, you have three times n. So what, what is the value of n? Left-hand side is equal to right-hand side. I'm giving you that hint also. This is the prime number. Right-hand side has to be a prime number of only one type of prime number, p1 cube. So n is what? Uh, the power of n would be 2. That's correct. Uh, of what that number would be. Correct. Exactly. See, this is like this. Think in this way. If it is just one prime number on the right hand side and the left hand side I can see is 3, then I can say that n has to be, my prime number p1 has to be 3. There's no other option. It has to be 3 only because left hand side has a 3. So I can say that n is 3 square or p1 square, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So from here, I can find out my total factors as 2 plus 1 equal to 3. That's one answer. But in the second case, notice 3 can be one prime number and P has to be the other prime number, right? Because they are, it's a product of two prime numbers. So I can say N is equal to P2 to the power 1. And if N is P2 to the power 1, then the total factor in this case would turn out to be, this is the power 1. So notice I'm getting two contradictory answers from the second statement. It either can be three, it can be two. Since I'm getting two contradictory answers, I will say this is not sufficient. So the correct answer in this case is going to be option A. So the only time while solving this question would be here. Again, keep in mind, this is something which you have, you have just learned. So it might take some time for you to get used to it. Okay, it might take some time to, you know, uh, um, uh, imbibe this methodology of uh, remembering that if it's a prime number, I need to write it as P1 to the power something. And if it's a composite, I need to break it down. So I would advise you to look at this video once again, this part of the video, try it again once on your, uh, at home, uh, and make sure that you're totally comfortable breaking it down very quickly. Because it, as I told you, the numbers will not become, uh, you know, huge. It will always be between one to seven, most of the queer questions. So if you are able to write these cases quickly, then you will be able to save a lot of time. Okay, if there are any doubts, please feel free to ask. If not, then we may have to move to the next question in the interest of time. I don't have a lot of time with me. And I still want to do at least two more questions with you. Okay, I don't see any questions in the chat box. If you have any questions, please feel free to post it here and I'll be more than happy to answer this. By the way, all variations of these kind of questions are also there in, uh, in uh, with the detailed solutions in our video lessons also. Okay, so some of the questions are in the free lessons. So you can look at Prime's video lesson uh, in a free trial and you'll find a lot of uh, detailed uh, discussion on this, on how to write it, all the different cases and everything. If you want more details uh, details on it. Uh, there are some of them which is in LCMG series. Unfortunately, uh, that's not in a free trial. That's for a paid users. But if you're interested in looking at it, then you can you know uh, buy our subscription. 
Uh, and as far as subscriptions are concerned, it's a very small announcement. Uh, uh, we usually used to sell our courses uh, of, uh, well, the validity of our courses was usually six months uh, for, the, for the last two years. But now we have kind of changed our plans. And uh, if anyone, anyone of one of you is interested in buying a shorter plan, you know, since uh, you're closer to your exam, then I would highly recommend looking at a, you know, two month plan, four month plan, uh, uh, especially if you're in the last leg and if you want to boost your prep, in quant verbal whatever be it you should definitely go and uh, check out our uh, these two plans uh, i am sharing the link of these uh, in case you want to look at it uh, you should uh, you can take a look Thick. now uh, let's move to the last part last section which is lcm gcd now there are two things uh, which I want to talk about. Even if, you're dis if we discuss less questions, that's totally fine. But we should be. Uh, I would want uh, all of you to learn this uh, really well or understand this really well. Is uh, if you're given, if you're told that the LCM of two numbers is something. So far, whatever we have been doing was either we were given one of the numbers and the LCM, and we were trying to find out uh, the other number, or we used to give. We, we were given two numbers and we were trying to find out the LCM. But as I told you, you can get questions which. Uh, where both of them would be variables, right? And the final LCM would be given. In these cases, how do you figure out the value of M and N? Can you tell me if the LCM of N and M is six, what are the different values that you can take, uh, M and N can take? LCM of N, M, N is six. What are the different values that M and N can take? Can you think of some values? Okay, so you'll say it's two, three, one, six, one, six, two, three. Uh, usually I get these two answers, uh, which are correct, but uh, keep in mind that there could be a lot of other cases also. It could be six, six, one, six, six, one, two, three, three, two, you know, two, six, three, six. 6, 2. All, all these cases are possible. Don't just, uh, if, if I'm splitting it into two parts, don't just think that it can take, um, you know, just 1, 6 or 2, 3 only. Okay. Uh, that's a good question. I've answered that I'm looking in, uh, at all the orders. Okay. Uh, but uh, but I hope this part is clear that uh, even if the order is not, at this point of time, honestly speaking, I'm not interested in the order. What I was interested in, are you able to think up, uh, you know, beyond 1, 6 and 2, 3 or not? So the idea is that you should be able to say think that it could be six six also, it could be two six also, it could be three six also. What you need to remember is that if the LCM is six, uh, you need to keep in mind that that LCM that you have got uh, is made up of these two numbers, two to the power one, three to the power one. So when you're trying to find out all the possibilities, what you need to keep in mind is that a particular number, like say for example m, can have both both these prime factors in it along with the power. Okay, so let's say if you're deciding that m has only two to the power one, hypothetically, okay, then while thinking about n, you have to make sure that n has three to the power one in it. Okay, it can it can have another case also. It can have two to the power one in it. That's also possible, but bare minimum it should have three to the power one in it. So if we are trying to write down the cases, we write it in this way. Okay, if m is two, n is three, n could be three, n could be three to the power one, two to the power one. Okay, if I say m has, say. 2 to the power 1, 3 to the power 1, both. Then what can be n? Then n can be 3, n can be 2, n can be 2 to the power 1, 3 to the power 1. All possible. There are, there are various possibilities out here. In the exam, don't worry. Very rarely will you get both of them as variable. Uh, uh, in most of the cases, you would be given questions like this at the LCM of, say, um, x and 9 as 45, say, for example. What are the possible values of x? And then you might need to figure out. Okay, now can anyone tell me, uh, I'm interested, if I tell you the LCM of X and 9 is say 45, can you tell me what are the values that X can take? This is definitely a GMAT-like statement that you can get in a DS, uh, you can get a DS statement like this. In fact, there is, I remember a GMAT prep question which has this kind of a statement. So if I tell you that the uh, LCM of X and 9 is 45, and if I ask you 
how many values x can take can you tell me how many values x can take and what are those values Take a time. Uh, you might need about 30, 45 seconds to do this. It's totally okay. But try to think in the way I've, I've told you to. The LCM is 45. So first of all, think what X must definitely have. That's number one. And then think what are the other possible things that it can have in it. Uh, if it sounds weak, don't worry, I'll show you. But uh, give it a shot once. In the meanwhile, let me rub this because I'll need space to discuss it. Okay, I see him says 12 different values. Okay. Uh, Aziz says three. Uh, I think it's three only. Uh, okay, Arlinda doesn't seem happy with this. Uh, okay, let me discuss it. This is, uh, this is slightly Yes, Aziz, you're correct. Correct. Uh, Sajal, you're also correct. See, what you do is, I'll, I'll tell you, it's, just, it's a very methodical uh, way you can do it. Okay, there are two steps that you need to keep in mind. That's all. See, I'm trying to find out the LCM of x and 3 square, and 45 is 3 square times 5 to the power 1. So the first thing that you do when you're trying to find out x, ask yourself what x must definitely have. Now ask yourself, from where did this 5 to the power 1 come? 9 doesn't have 5 to the power 1, right? So this 5 to the power 1 has to come from somewhere. From where will it come? It will come from x only. It must have come from x. So that should be a first thought process, okay? That should be a first thought process. That x must, 5 must be coming from x, okay? Now, the second thing is regarding 3 square. Now, as I told you, x could also contain 3 square. That's not a problem, okay? But how do I figure out how many cases? So what I tell students is that don't try to, you know, Think in this way that x, if x has 3 in it, it cannot be beyond 3 square. For example, if I say, if I give x 3 cube, my LCM would change, right? I told you LCM considers the highest power. So it cannot have 3 cube in it. So even if it has 3 in it, it has to be lesser than 2, lesser or equal to 2. So one case would be that x doesn't have in it at all. X, x doesn't have 3 in it. The second case could be that if it has, then it will have either a smaller one smaller power or equal power. It cannot go beyond that. So there are only three possible cases. That's it. How, how I write it is like this, 3 to the power 0, 3 to the power 1, 3 to the power 2. So I, I can very clearly see that there are three possible cases. This is something that you can definitely get in the exam. As I told you, there's a GMAT prep question or based on this only, where you need to find out the possible values. Uh, there are other ways to solve it, but this is one way of solving that question. Okay. Uh, Mridula, it x cannot be 1 because if x turns out to be 1, you can understand, right? My LCM would change. My LCM would become 9. Okay. So I need to ensure that my LCM doesn't change. Okay. So for my LCM to not change, x should definitely have 5 to the power 1 in it. Okay. So the LCM part is the tricky part. I hope this is clear. The GC, GCD fortunately is easy. Now, when I say that the GCD of two numbers is 6, Okay, you remember that what is GCD? GCD is the common part in both the numbers, right? So if GCD is the common part, part in both the numbers, that means that uh, both of them should have six in it, bare minimum six in it. So in the exam, if you're dealing with variables, and this is what can come in the exam, this part where GCD dealing with two variables, you need to write your M and N like this, six times K1 and six times K2, because they'll definitely have six in it. And where K1 and K2 are co-prime, that means they do not have anything else common in it, or the GCD is one, is what I mean by this. Uh, now, again, if this sounds confusing, let me take an example. Let's say uh, I take 12 and 18, okay? Now, let's say this is N, this is M. So what would be the GCD? This is M. Notice that the GCD would be the common part. They both have 2 and 3 in it, and I'll have to take the lower power. So the GCD turns out to be 6. Okay. So N can be written as 6 times 2. This can be written as 6 times 3. 
So notice they can be written as GCDs times something. So n is basically GCD times something, some integer. m is GCD times some integer. But these integers should not have anything in common. No factor in common. So 2 and 3 cannot have anything in common. Because if, if they have something in common, my GCD would change. Is this part clear, everyone? Why I am saying that K1 and K2 should not have anything in common? For example, if I take K1 as 4 and K2 as 6, okay, they are different numbers, but they have 2 in common. So my, my GCD would change from 6 to 12. Okay, that is why whenever I'm taking K1 and K2, I have to take something. So if I'm taking this as 6, K2 should not have 2 and 3. It can have anything else. It could be 5, it could be uh, four, uh, you know, uh, 7, 35. But K1 and K2 should not have anything in common. So in the exam, when you have to set up your equation, this is the way you set it up. So I hope for difficult questions, it's clear how you need to approach LCM GCD questions. In LCM, you first of all, step one is to find out what is, you know, which definitely needs to be present in the number. And whatever is left, it can have in it, but it should have a lower power. So if I have three squared, then it could have three to the power zero, three to the power one, three to the power two. Okay. If you have GCD, GCD of two numbers is something, you need to express it as GCD, GCD times certain integer, GCD times certain integer. And these two integers should not have anything common, they, the common factor. Okay. Now let's do uh, two questions on it. Let, let's try this one first, and then we'll do a seven level question. For this question, I'll give you one and a half minute. In, uh, in case if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. By the way, guys, once again, if you're enjoying this video, if you're liking this, if you're finding this helpful, I would request you to please uh, like this video. Okay, you can start posting the responses. The greatest common divisor of P and Q, Amira. The greatest common divisor of P and Q. Okay. Okay, let's start the discussion. I can see most of you are saying A. I, I hope you found this question easy, right? Uh, there wasn't much of a trick in it, especially with whatever we have discussed so far. This should have been uh, quite easy to solve. Now, uh, I know ratio is something that we haven't discussed, but whenever we are given that the ratio of two numbers, let's in this case, like P and Q, two positive integers, is three is to four, that means I can write P as three times X and Q as four times X. That, that's the meaning of ratio, okay? So if ratio is 3 is to 4, then that means P is 3X, Q is 4X. Now, um, the second piece of information is very important, okay? Because if the first piece of information is given to us that the ratio is 3 is to 4, then P and Q can take any value. They can be, you know, they can be 3 and 4, they can be 6 and 8, uh, they can be 9 and 12, and so on and so forth. All of these have the ratio 3 is to 4, okay? But the second piece of information is that is given to me is that the GCD of three times X and the GCD of four times X is one. Okay. So uh, when would this be one? That is the question that you need to ask yourself. 
remember that we already i already told you that gcd only takes the common part the common that thing that is present in both of them obviously 3 and 2 square are two different things two different numbers two different prime factors 3 and 2 what is common in both the numbers the common number is x so i would say that the gcd of 3x and 2 square x is x okay is this part clear for example if i told you gcd of you know x y and x z would be what let's say y is not equal to z by do not have anything common and nothing like that then i would take the common part right and i would say that the gcd is x okay again a simplified example but just to let you know that we are taking the common thing out out of both the numbers so this has been given as one to us so if this has been given to one to us then we can say that the value of p is three and the value of q is four so the correct answer in the so the product in this case would be three times four which is 12 that's it nothing else okay i hope this is perfectly clear guys any questions any doubts please feel free to ask okay i don't see any questions so let's take one last question which is this one and i'll give you one small hint here uh this is something that uh, uh, I haven't discussed yet, but you, if you want, you can use it in this question that LCM times GCD is product of two numbers. So uh, product of the two numbers. So what I mean by that, that is that LCM of P and Q times GCD of P and Q is basically equal to P times Q. Without knowing this also, you can still solve the question. That's not a problem, but maybe for some of you, it might be helpful. Okay. Uh, this is slightly on the tricky side. So I'll give you about two and a half minutes to do this one. And then we'll start the discussion. This basically uses whatever we have, whatever we were discussing uh, in, you know, before this question, before the last question, how to represent GCD, how to think about the various values of LCM. That is something that we are going to use here. Those of you who are done may start posting your responses now. So that's still 30 seconds. But even if you are done, you can post your response. Uh, Sammy, this is seven level plus question. Oops. This is definitely a bit time consuming also. These are this these kind of questions may take you about two and a half minutes in the exam or three minutes also to do it, especially if you're not aware of those kind of concepts that we discussed a while back.
Okay, you're asking which level is question five. I'll have to go back and look at it, Sammy. <laughs> um, give me one sec, let me check. Question five or six hundred level, by the way. Okay, guys, responses. I don't see any response. I'll wait for another thirty seconds. Okay, now it's close to, I would say, four minutes. So uh, start taking a calculated guess, I would say. If you had to mark something based on whatever you have done so far, what would you mark? Okay, Aziz says D, Sigil says C, I'm not sure though. Okay, Jimmy says C, okay. Gagan says E, okay. Uh, okay, all kinds of, I have a D, C, E. Anyone with A, B? Uh, by the way, the, the formula that I gave you is not necessary to use, okay? You can still get the answer based on pure conceptual LCMGC knowledge that we talked about. But uh, uh, in this case, I'll show you both. Not a problem, okay? See, for uh, this is I like this question a lot because uh, though, uh, especially because of the conceptual you know, clarity that you need for LCMGC to solve this question. But apart from that, this is one of the uh, really good questions where, uh, and a good example of a DS question where pre-analysis, if you spend time doing your pre-analysis, which may take you two to three minutes uh, to, to do, but once you do it properly, you will hardly be spending any time in the questions, uh, in the question statement, these two statements. You'll be able to answer the question very quickly if you do your pre-analysis really well, especially uh, which I highly recommend when it comes to data sufficiency questions. So let's see uh, what I mean by that pre-analysis and what conceptual knowledge we need to use. Question seven is pretty straightforward. They are telling me that the LCM of P and Q is 630. So if it is 630, obviously you need to uh, kind of break it down. Uh, you'll have two to the power one uh, and 63, right? So three square, five to the power one, seven to the power one, 63, seven times nine. Yeah, I think this is correct. Yes, this is correct, okay. Uh, the second information that is given to us is that the GCD of P and Q is 18, which is three square times two to the power one. I'm kind of writing in this way so that, you know, I can see what is what. Now, as I told you, I've all, uh, when you see GCD of two numbers is P and Q, the first thing without thinking a lot is to write down P as 18K1 and Q as 18K2. Okay, and infer or write down somewhere that K1 and K2 are co-prime. They cannot have anything in common, anything else. They need to be different. Okay, I hope this part is clear. Okay, now what you can do is, as I told you, is that you can use the formula to get the answer. So let me just show you how you can get the answer using the formula. So uh, whenever, and by the way, it's recommended that if LCM GCT product of two numbers is given, you use the formula because then you can get your answer very quickly. So if I know that LCM times GCD is P times Q, uh, I know my LCM is what? Two to the power one, three square, five to the power one, seven to the power one. And I know GCD is two to the power one, three square. I know P is 18K1 and Q is 18K2, okay? Now 18 is what? 3 square 9 is 18. So I can cancel off this 18 and this 18. Okay. I can cancel off this 18 and this 18. So notice what am I left with? K1 times K2 is 5 times 7. 
Okay, so if you're using the formula, you can use this formula to figure out what K1 and K2 could be. You could have conceptually also said the same thing, by the way. You could have said, hey, uh, 2 to the power 1 times 3 square is present in both of them. Okay, there's nothing else present in both of them. So this 5 to the power 1, 7 to the power 1 cannot be present in both Q, P and Q. I cannot have a 5 to the power 1 here also and a 5 to the power 1 here also because that would change my GCD. So this 5 to the power 1, 7 to the power 1 can either go to one one of them or I have to split this among these two. Okay, that's a conceptual way of thinking if you don't want to use the formula. But K1 and K2 are what? They're integers, right? So the left-hand side is an integer. So the right-hand side can uh, is also an integer, right? So I can write uh, third, five times seven in two ways. One is I can say K1 times K2 is five times seven. Okay, or I can say K1 times K2 is I can multiply these two and say 35 times one. Okay, is this clear? Obviously the order would matter. Like for example, there would be four cases. Case one would be P is equal to 18 times. I can give K1 five and I can give this as seven. Okay, opposite is also possible. P is 18 times seven, Q is 18 times five. And by the way, keep in mind, you could have done this conceptually also. You could have given five to K1, 7 to k2 and then you could have flipped it so again just letting you know formula is not really important if you would have forgotten it also that's not a problem the second is i can give all this 35 to one of these numbers so i can say k1 is 35 18 times 35 and 18 times 1 18 times 1 18 times 35 i'll pause here uh, just to make sure that this is perfectly clear. If there are any doubts, please feel free to ask. Notice what I did. I did not think too much. I've already told you what is the process. If GCD of two numbers is given, you, you should definitely write it in this way. LCM GCD, you need to break it down and see what is not present in both of them. What is common, I have already seen. I've already accounted that for. What is not present, I need to put it somewhere. So either you conceptually think five and seven can go either ways, okay? or you can use the LCM GCD formula to come up to the same conclusion. But at the end of the day, you will come up with these four cases. Any doubts? If this is perfectly clear, can I get a quick yes in the chat box? Yes, this is perfectly clear. And this is what I meant by pre-analysis. See, I'm taking my time. I'm not worrying about statement. I'm not jumping directly into the statement because I know as a process, these are certain things which I should definitely do. I should complete this step and then move on to the statement, whatever that statement would be. Okay, so with these four cases in mind, I will now look at each and every statement. Okay, my first statement is P is a multiple of 35. Okay, if P is a multiple of 35, think about it. Uh, if P is a multiple of 35, this case is not possible. This case is not possible. Only this case is possible, right? And this case is also not possible. If P is a multiple of 35, then P has to be 18 times 35 and Q has to be 18, right? So that means P will get all 7 and 5 in it. And see, I'm getting one unique case out here. One, I, I could discard all, the, I can discard all these three cases because in this case, I don't have a 7. In this case, I don't have a 5. In this case, I don't have a 7 and 5. And I need both of them because the statement says P is a multiple of 5. So I'm since I'm getting one unique case, I would say this is sufficient. Okay, now let's look at the second statement. So statement one is sufficient, our answer has to be either A or D. Now they're saying that the GCD of 35 and uh, Q is one. Can anyone tell you what is the meaning of this? What can I infer from this? If they're telling me Q and 35 GCD is one, what does that mean? Does Q contain 35 or does Q does not contain 35? The GCD of Q 35 is one. Q does not contain 35, right? Because if it would have contained 35 or if it would have contained 5 also, then or 7 also, then the GCD would have changed. So the inference is that Q doesn't have a 5 in it. Q doesn't have a 7 in it. Q doesn't have either of these two. It doesn't have it at all. Okay, because if it would, if it would have had 5 in it also, then my GCD would change. If it would have 7 in it also, then the GCD would change. The moment I make this inference that Q doesn't have 5 or 7, I can discard this case because Q has a 7 in it. 
So I'll discard this case. I'll discard this case because Q has a five in it. And I obviously I'll discard the last case also because Q has a 35 in it. So notice once again, I am just left with one of these cases, which is this one, a unique case. So I'll say this is sufficient. So notice when I'm analyzing my statement, I'm not doing a lot. See, I did not do any calculation. I just looked at my four cases and decided which one fits in, which one doesn't fit in, in the in the info that based on the information that is given in the statement. That's it. Okay. So I hope this is clear. I'll summarize it very quickly, whatever we have done today, so that it's perfectly clear to you and you can use these methodologies easily. Remember that in case of uh, questions which are based on devices and multiples, look at the word keyword device and multiple and then take a call whether you need to find out the LCM GCD or not, especially if you are given statements like X is a multiple of two numbers or X is a device of two numbers. In case of total factors, you already know how to find out the total factor directly. But if the total factor is given to you and you need to find something else, remember the prime and composite case that I told you. If you apply that, you will get your answers very quickly. Number three and the last is as far as LCM GCD is concerned, keep in mind that if they are telling you LCM of X and Y is something, uh, you have to consider all possible cases. In case of GCD, you should always be able to write it in this form and then solve the question. Because once you have an equation, now, you'll always be able to get some answer. Okay. And obviously, we have a formula here. If you if you see there's a question which is based on both LCM, GCD, two numbers, if you want to simplify your calculation, get your answers very quickly and again, try and do your inference based on equations, then this is the best way to do it. Okay, so with this, guys, I've come to the end of my uh, webinar. If you have any questions uh, regarding GMAT, GMAT Con, GMAT Wiz, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, and once again, sharing the links, just in case if you're interested in our uh, plans that we recently launched, uh, you can use this link to look at our basic plans. And just in case, if you want to talk to us, figure out how we can help you improve your account, ace your account, or how we can help you ace GMAT in general, I'm sharing a calendar link. Uh, you can book a call with us. This call is completely free. And uh, you know we can tell you how you can we can help you improve in GMAT. Okay. In the meantime, I'll wait for some time. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I am there for another two, three minutes. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed this session, guys. Uh, any feedback, anything at all, please feel free to give. Any other topics that you would want me to take up in the upcoming webinars, also let me know so I can take those up. Okay. Good question, Susan. Susan, let me post it here. Okay. Any other questions apart from that? Okay. Uh, if you have any question, guys, please feel free to ask. I'll take it up. Okay. But as far as this is concerned, Susan, think in this way. There are certain numbers which are divisible by six. Okay. There are certain numbers which are divisible by eight. And there would be some common numbers out here. Okay. Which are divisible by both and eight, six and eight. So your job would be to first of all, find out number of numbers which are divisible by six. Okay. Then you need to find out the number of numbers which are divisible by eight. So you will get this whole part, number of numbers divisible by six, this will tell you. And it told you how to do it. You simply divide 200 by six and find the quotient. That will tell you. So in this case, we got 33, if you remember, right? 200 by 200 divided by six gave us 33. So there are 33 numbers which are divisible by six. As far as eight is concerned, once again, divide 200 by eight and figure out how many numbers that are divisible by eight, okay? So two is 16, 25 numbers. And then you find out the number of numbers which are divisible by both of them. So basically those numbers would be divisible by, if they're divisible by six and eight, they have to be divisible by 24, okay? Then you find out 200 divided by 24 and you get that quotient. So this would be how much, uh, should I take eight? 192, I think, right? 192. So there are eight numbers like this. So what you do is to find out the total numbers, you do 33 plus 25. So this whole thing is 33, by the way. This whole thing is 25. And since you're counting this twice, you're counting this part twice, you need to subtract by eight and then you get your answer. Okay, let me know if anything is not clear, Susan. I know I did this a bit quickly also, but uh, if there's any doubt in this one, please feel free to ask. Okay, I'll look at uh, the other questions quickly. I can see uh, one question from Sejal, which is, 
if I give GMAT in December 22 and apply in two colleges later to build profile, meanwhile, will it be fine? Uh, no, it will not hinder your process, Sejal. In fact, uh, that's a good plan if you want to get uh, you know, done with your GMAT quickly and then later on apply for it, uh, then you can definitely do that. That's no issue at all. Uh, you can, you know, uh, apply for two years later. The, the validity is for five years, if you know that. So obviously, you can apply anytime within those in five years. It doesn't hamper your admission process at all. And it makes sense that you build your profile in the meantime. So you can prepare GMAT free without any attention. Most of the uh, there are a lot of people who come at the last, uh, you know, at the end and then want to prepare for it under pressure. Uh, in your case, if you prepare from beforehand, that would be great. Uh, I'm glad you like, you like this session, Duncan, Jimmy. Any other feedback, guys, please feel free to give. Any other sessions, topics that you would want me to cover, uh, please let me know. I'll be more than happy to uh, take those up in the next webinars. And in case uh, you want to talk to us, the candy link is already there, but there's an email ID also given here. If you want to talk to us on WhatsApp, uh, the WhatsApp number is also here. Please feel free to you know get in touch with us. Okay, I don't see any more questions, uh, so I will end the session. In fact, we uh, kind of ended up taking two hours to complete this, uh, but that's okay. I hope you'll enjoy it, guys. Have a great day then. Bye.